So, Bob Gans, it's an honor to interview you, my associate of 30 years. Bob, tell us about your, your beginnings and your motivation to go into medicine and moving on. From the very beginning? From the very beginning. From the very beginning. Um, I grew up in Chicago. Um, it's interesting, most of my family actually was in the medical profession. My uncle was an obstetrician. My dad was a dentist. Um, my uncle worked for the NIH. He funded medical research. So it was sort of a natural thing in my family to uh, migrate to the medical profession. So I followed the line, basically. Uh, I was actually interested in anthropology. I was interested in a lot of things, anthropology. I was interested in English. I was interested in history, but uh, I decided to do medicine. It turned out to be a great decision. For both of us. Go on, and then you went into medicine. So I went to medical school at the University of Illinois. Uh, had a lot of fun. Illinois has a great history of ulcer research. Uh, Morton Grossman was there for a few years. And there's a fellow there named Andrew Ivey who was big into ulcer research. And he sort of uh, got into a little bit of trouble with um, not malfeasance research-wise, but he sort of went off the deep end on um, uh, sort of a Laetrile-like product. But he was very highly regarded. And Illinois was really a great great place for uh, ulcer research. So it was there that I actually got interested in uh, acid physiology, just because of the history of the place. And um, I got interested in ulcer disease, and I sort of stayed with it all these years. And then you uh, moved on and stuck in GI training? Yeah, I, I went through my internship and residency at Illinois, and uh, I took a year off to teach and I was at the University of Illinois as, a, as an assistant professor. And then I went back and did a GI fellowship at Northwestern. Don Ostro was nice enough to take me into the program. And I had a great time at Northwestern. Peter Carillus was there, and Andy Bly was there, and Ostro was there. Uh, there weren't a lot of professors there full time. They had a lot of uh, private practice guys. Time. Marshall Spargberg was there, and uh, Howard Schachter was there, Ed Ollinger was there. So they had a lot of inflammatory bowel disease experience from the private guys. Andy Bly was the hepatologist there. I ended up in his lab. Uh, Don Ostro was into bile acids. Bob Hammer was there into peptide YY. And then, of course, Peter Curlis came, and he got me interested in the esophagus. And so I stayed in esophagus. Uh, what's evolved in your lifetime in general and with your own projects in, in the esophagus and inventions in general? Yeah, my, my research has really been device research, mainly related to peptic ulcer disease and acid physiology, reflux and Barrett's. That's sort of been my, my area of interest. And I got, in, I got into it uh, very much by accident. As you know, we've, we're in private practice and we mainly see patients. But I happened to become friends with Brian Zellickson, who is the uh, director of the electron microscopy lab at the University of Minnesota. And Brian was interested in devices. So he became a good friend, and we got interested in devices. And so we started doing things. I was interested in H. pylori uh, because of the peptic ulcer disease interest. And I was having dinner with Brian uh, one night. Uh, I was at Nora's restaurant. Uh, you may remember it. It's no longer there. They had great meatloaf. And uh, I was there eating meatloaf with Brian. And uh, he asked me, he said, what needs to be done in GI? And I said, well, there's this clot test that came out for H. pylori, but it needs an incubator. There's no incubator. So within a week, uh, we had an incubator built, and we tested it. It worked pretty well. And incubators are the, one of the few classes of devices that are totally exempt from FDA regulation. I remember I called up the FDA. I said, I've got this incubator. What do I need to do? And the guy said, nothing. We're totally exempt. I said, do you need a letter? you need data? He said, I need nothing. I said, really? He said, yeah. So we ended up selling that within about three months. And we made some money. And I thought, this is the easiest job in the world. <laughs> and so we kept going. I had no idea what, uh, what I was about to encounter. It got a lot tougher after that. But then we did a few little things. We did a rotatable biopsy forceps. You actually mentioned to me one day that uh, the field needed a rotatable biopsy forceps. 
So we made a uh, night and all forceps that was this position out of the scope, and it kept straight in the scope. And as soon as it came out of the scope, it took its curved position. So Boston Scientific licensed that from us. I don't think they ever developed it. And then we did a uh, laterally affecting ERCP cannula. I wasn't very good at ERCP, and so I thought I'd make it easier for myself. So we did that, little things. And then um, uh, I got a little bit of a reputation as a device guy, just uh, doing little things. And then uh, Paul Dickinson called me up one day, our partner, Paul Dickinson. And in Minnesota, you know, there's 350 device companies and there's thousands of device engineers. There's a device engineer in every street corner. So a lot of companies needed consulting. So Paul called me up one day. He said, I know you're interested in devices. You've done some stuff. And he said, um, I'm consulting for a cardiology company, but I've decided I'm going to go to law school. I said, Paul, you really want to go to law school? Remember? He went to law school. So he said, yeah, I want to go to law school. He had eight children, busy practice as we have, and he decided to go to law school. But he said, I have this obligation at a cardiology company. Would you take over for me? So I said, sure, I'll do it. So I walked in, and they made this little tiny balloon that they floated into a coronary artery. It emitted gamma radiation to prevent coronary artery restenosis. So in those years, when you did an angioplasty, there's about a 30% restenosis rate. And they tried to prevent it by irradiating the coronary arteries. And it worked. It actually worked. This is before there were cardiac stents. So they wanted to expand their company into the GI business. So they said, what can you do? What ideas do you have for us? So I just sat around a table. I sketched out a few ideas for them. And they filed a patent based on my ideas. Then a few months after that, cardiac stents came out, coronary artery stents came out, and the company went out of business. So when the company went out of business, there was a big argument over who was going to own the patents. And to resolve the GI issue, they just gave me the GI patent. So I ended up owning this GI patent for putting electromagnetic radiation into the GI tract. So from there, uh, Brian and I went down a bunch of different paths. So I was still interested in H. pylori. So at first we thought maybe we could use gamma radiation to kill H. pylori. But uh, after a few weeks, that we knew that wouldn't work because it was too uh, carcinogenic. So I didn't tell the story last night, but um, we started researching H. pylori. We came across this Japanese video, just looking out around at stuff. And the video filmed H. pylori. It was supposed to be a movie about H. pylori. Well, every time they filmed the organism, the organism stopped moving. It was amazing. So we thought maybe visible light is doing something to H. pylori. So we started looking into it. It turned out it was blue light that killed H. pylori, 405 nanometer light, the kind of light that my ja blue violet light. So we just stumbled onto that. It was amazing. So we started a company to use blue light to kill H. pylori. And we, we actually raised quite a bit of money. It, it didn't work. And the reason why it didn't work is because this is before there were blue light LEDs. There were no LEDs then. LEDs were just coming out. So we had to use a parabolic reflector to get enough blue light into the stomach. It was very clumsy, and it created a lot of heat in the balloon. The balloon got hot. So then we had to cool the balloon. It was a little cumbersome. If there were blue light LEDs now, I think the company would, would do well. So uh, that company ultimately failed. And it failed because uh, we could reduce H. pylori by about five logs. We would take it from you know, 100 million organisms down to about 1,000 organisms in the stomach using our parabolic reflector. Um, but that wasn't enough, actually. So even 1,000 organisms, the stomach would repopulate. So that failed. So uh, we were a little bit depressed. But then we still had the patent. And we thought, what else can we do with it? So then we started treating reflux by putting electrodes on the balloon. And we thought we would scar the GE junction. And that was the concept behind the Strata device, although we licensed it away. I didn't think it would work, so we licensed that away. And then uh, at the same time, I was more interested in Barrett. So we thought, we'll license this away, get rid of that, and then we'll take that money and we'll focus on ablating Barrett's esophagus using a radiofrequency uh, ablation tool. Now, in those years, when you had a, I'll just use this, when you had a paddle, that you're going to radiate, there was one anode and one cathode. 
So the anode would try to find the cathode. As the electrons came around, it would create a very wide arc of injury. So we found an electrical engineer, Roger Stern, and he came up with the idea of putting in multiple anodes and cathodes. Anode, cathode, anode, cathode, anode, cathode. And so we had little, these little baby circuits. So we would marry these little baby circuits. And so uh, we marched across the paddle with these tiny little baby circuits. So we had 30 wires and 15 circuits on a little paddle. Uh, it was brilliant. And, and so it was it non-penetrating. It, was, it limited the depth of ablation to no more than 500 microns every time. It was fantastic. So we started, uh, we went into the animal lab, and we didn't have a Barrett's model, of course, so we started using squamous mucosa. So we burned porcine live pigs, squamous mucosa. And we would take the esophagus out, and I would take a Kleenex, and I could wipe the mucosa off of the submucosa. Just wipe it right off. It turned out these were very discrete layers. I don't know that anybody even appreciates how discrete these layers are. So we would totally, they were separate layers. They're not welded together. So we would take off the mucosa and the submucosa would be pristine, perfect, untouched. It was amazing. When I saw that, I knew it could work. So then we optimized the power and energy densities. We were nervous because we did it in a squamous model. We didn't have a Barrett's model. They're different epithelia, but we didn't have a Barrett's model. So um, we had everything worked out. We had the proper energy and power density, 40 watts per centimeter squared. And then we varied the energy density depending. It came out to about 300 watts on a balloon. It's, comp it's a little complicated because the, as the balloon diameter changed, the energy densities were changed. But it was approximately 300 watts, depending on what the size of the balloon was. And then I wrote a protocol for uh, esophagectomy patients who had cancer to ablate them pre-surgery. Dan Dunn was our surgeon. He did the surgery, and he was nice enough to let us ablate these patients prior to surgery. And after surgery, I saw the same thing. The mucosa just came right off. And so I knew we had it. And uh, we had all the energy and power densities worked out. We had uh, everything was made, and we were ready to go. We were FDA approved. We got FDA approved or FDA cleared, it was a 510K clearance. We were lucky there. And, um, but we, we hit a, a, a wall because nobody would fund us. It took us three years to get funded because um, every time a, a venture capitalist would call one of my colleagues, they would say, the idea is crazy, it'll never work. You'll stricture, it'll never work. And so it took us three years to raise money. And then we uh, came across, finally, a guy named Doug Kelly to a family member who had died of adenocarcinoma of the esophagus arising out of Barrett's. And he was very intrigued. And so he started funding us. So we raised some money from him. And then we went into uh, clinical trials. We hired Greg Barrett and Dave Utley to run the company. And uh, Utley redid my experiments, saw the same exact thing. And then he knew it could work. And then uh, we went into clinical trials. And then we just started uh, going that way. And. Um how many people have been using this device or have been used upon this device? So in the last 15 years, we've done uh, approximately 250,000 ablations in 1,500 medical centers. And uh, using Roger's design, I give him all the credit in the world, uh, we've had zero thermal perforations and zero deaths. It's really uh, remarkable. Well, originally, um, you had one size balloon or you had to you didn't have a sizing device. No, we actually had many different size balloons, but we didn't have a sizing balloon. So I had to go in and estimate the diameter of the esophagus, which I got quite good at after a while. Uh, but it wasn't as precise as the sizing balloon. So I said to Roger, you know, we really should have a sizing balloon. So it was easy. You know, he had the inner diameter of the esophagus, we had the volume of the balloon, and we could figure out, just had the computer figure out how to expand the balloon. And then uh, from there, uh, we invented the uh, partial ablation device, the Halo 90. And uh, uh, then we, then we uh, got going. So it was, a, it was a really series of interesting and lucky breaks that uh, got us there. Yeah, but you had to obviously have the motivation behind this. I mean, you're a guy who works as hard as anyone in our practice. And you have three kids at home and a wife. What, uh, what motivates you after a hard day's work? Yeah, it's a good question. To go back and create and write? That one I, I can't answer. 
the motivation is internal and I don't know what set of you know parental environmental genetic psychiatric factors got to be a little bit nutty to do this work uh, lead you to do that that that's a mystery to me some people have it and some people don't but that motivation I know has to be internal it can't come from outside so I was always internally motivated uh, but I had to have the right circumstances to bring it out so I was internal I was strongly motivated to do uh, interesting and novel work and then I was lucky enough to fall into a field uh, where we could do it and uh, you've accomplished that and uh, you know culminating in receiving uh, the famous Schindler Award yeah. last evening which is a great honor yeah. and I'm proud to be your partner yeah thank you we were lucky you know we were lucky I had the motivation but we were lucky. You have to find the right people. It's a lot about the right people. You know, Roger was the right person for us. He was really motivated to do the work. Um, and interestingly, the most, the luckiest thing was I work with nobody in the field of GI because everybody told us what I was trying to do was impossible. They said, it's impossible. You can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do it. You get too many strictures, never work, buried glands. It was a sea of negativity. And I'd go to work every day and I'd call people and I would get this sea of negativity. And it started to wear me down. And then I would talk to Brian, who was a dermatologist, and Brian said, yeah, we could do it. And I talked to Roger and Roger said, what's the problem? He said, we'll do it. So if they had been in the field of GI, you know, they would have been contaminated with the same negativity. So I learned the motivation comes from inside. After that, it's the people you work with and it's everybody makes mistakes but you can't make fatal mistakes so we didn't make fatal mistakes we had, we made our mistakes uh, but it's the people and the motivation and um, you have to have a little bit of luck too we were very lucky and you did, you'd say the same thing about our practice that we have the kind of people that support us very well well, our practice is good because it's a quasi-academic practice. We have lots of interesting, smart people and a lot of academic refugees, you know, so it's a milieu for generating ideas and cross-fertilization. And a bunch of people who just want to continue to learn and experience. Yeah. And then the other thing is you have to have an open mind. You have to keep an open mind. You can't have preconceived notions, you know, is another well, thing. It's very important. You have to stay open to all possibilities. So let me ask you this, as we close. If you are starting out now, how would you approach things? Or what advice would you give to new people coming into the field of medicine and specifically gastroenterology? Yeah, so what I would say is I can't give you the motivation. I can't, I, can't, I can't teach you motivation. You can't take a class on motivation. You, you have to be motivated. There's got to be a reward there somewhere. Well, there has to be a reward, but you come to me with the motivation. I can't give you the motivation. So that starts wherever that starts. After that, um, you have to have an idea you're interested in, and you have to surround yourself with the right people. But I use the analogy of driving a car. Uh, last night I spoke about this uh, novelist E.L. Doctorow and he talked about how the best advice you give somebody for writing a novel is you can drive across the country just seeing in the, in the middle of the night just seeing as far as your headlights go. You don't have to see the final destination. You don't have to see all the things around you in the dark. You can just go a few feet at a time the next step, the next step, the next block, the next mile. And you can drive across the whole country doing it that way. And I don't know if that's good advice for writing a novel or not. I've never written a novel, but it's the best advice for being an innovator. People get overwhelmed by the steps and the end game. But if you just move that innovation car one block at a time, just the next step, the next step, and that's where the motivation comes. Um, and you have to be persistent because um, there's a lot of roadblocks along the way, a lot of detours. But if you keep driving the car, you'll do okay. It's a great metaphor. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Bob. Yeah, thanks, David. It was great.